Great pleasure to introduce uh, Victor Sandras to you. Um, when we talk about yields and yield potential, a lot of the time we are dealing with the subject of wheat physiology. And if you look through the annals of the papers around the physiology and agronomy generally, um, Victor's name comes up on a regular basis. And so it's a great pleasure to have you here, Victor, to talk about yields, high yields, how we achieve them. So we're very much looking forward to what you've got to say. Um, Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much, Nick and uh, Rachel and the team for the invitation. It's great to be here looking at this green landscape. There's nothing green left in South Australia. We harvest our crops uh, over the last two weeks. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really nice to be here. Uh, first, I will open with a very personal view of this kind of uh, research and development in high yielding environments. It might, it's an outsider's view and it might be naive, but bear with me. So if we look at, uh, say, lentil in Australia, we are 20 years behind Canada. And being behind means you can learn, you have a perspective, it's low hanging fruit. We can ask what's similar and what's different between Australia and Canada. So in, in lentil, we're between 30 and 50 years behind wheat. And that means low hanging fruit again. Tony Fisher in the 1980s determined the critical period for wheat, and we'll see the critical period of crops in a moment. We just done the critical period for pulses on a shoestring budget. When we look at high yielding crops, they are pockets across Australia, and they are together small compared to medium and high rainfall. So in proportion to the industry, there is investment, but we are lagging behind in high yielding crops in, in research and development. And that means there is low hanging fruit. I think this is an outstanding example of how much you could do with a modest investment. So this I would regard as a low risk, high return investment. So, uh, so it started formally in 2016 with, with local and it expanded nationally. And you have evidence of 10 tons plus, which for a break crop is not, it's not a bad deal. So I think, so what you see today here is the opportunities for this high uh, rainfall cropping with a modest investment, I would say. A disclaimer, I'm a crop scientist. I understand the crops a little bit, but you have to understand the crop. So in date, variety, getting your flower in time right, canopy management, uh, root diseases, foliar diseases, pathogens that develop resistant weeds, uh, fertilizer, grain standards, marketing risk, make decisions and make money at the end of the day. So you are the experts. I'm not going to give you any recommendation. It would be, I wouldn't dare. So what I'm going to do instead is share a few principles. And the outcome of those principles will be one, you go home with a view that reinforces what you do. So if I do ABC, I have this result. And that makes sense with the physiology of the crop. The second outcome is that you go home with doubts. You go home with these principles challenging your view of the crop. And that will be the more profitable outcome for you, I hope, to, to inspire some uh, different ways to think. You're going to invest 30 minutes of your life here, times this many people. For me, that kind of numbers is, uh, is humbling, but I hope you get some return for this investment. So, if we ask an agronomist, tell me how much nitrogen do you need in a crop? Then you would say, well, it depends. It depends on soil moisture, expected rainfall that gives me the potential yield, times protein that gives me the, the demand for nitrogen. Then we need to look at soil nitrogen and mineralization the price of fertilizer, the price of wheat. So there is half a dozen reasons why we cannot give a straight answer to the question, how much fertilizer do we need? And that's common to many of the questions we ask in agriculture. That's the complexity of the system. The principles I've shared in today 
are in sharp contrast to that. These principles of physiology of crops do not depend on the variety, do not don't depend on the on the soil or the weather or, or, or the management. That's how strong these principles are. So let's start with principle number one, and that is all flowering plants overproduce flowers. So you don't see that in wheat because the flowers are hidden, but if you see that in a canola crop, there are thousands of flowers, the crop overshoots and then kills flowers. You could see in a jacaranda tree at bloom, it's thousands of flowers and only a few of them would make it. And, and that's hard wiring in, in plants, no exception. The consequence from overproducing flowers is that crops accommodate environmental variation through grain number. So yield is grain number times grain weight. And the two are important. If we are looking at the 5-10% difference in yield, it could be either grain number or grain weight. But if we look at a two-fold difference in yield, so if we want to get our crop from 6 to 12 tons, it's no way around, that's grain number. Right? So you could see if you have the booklet, um, I don't know what page is. It's page nine, figure one. Okay, did you find that figure? So what you see there is that in the range from a failed crop to potential, 80% of the variation in yield is grain number. This is a principle, it doesn't depend on the variety, it doesn't depend on the soil, the climate or the management. 80% of the variety of the yield is grain number. And don't get me wrong, you don't want screenings, you want good plump grains and so forth, but the point is we could get distracted chasing grain weight when the game is getting the numbers. There are trade-offs and so forth, but the grain number is, is the key. And uh, one way to, to think of this is a system that has a coarse regulation and a fine regulation. So the grain number gives you the coarse regulation. The grain number gives you the two-fold difference in yield. The grain weight gives you the 5-10% difference in yield. So that's the first principle. Grain number is king. The second principle is that if we accept that the most important component of yield is grain number, grain number is defined in a critical window that only depends on the crop species. So if we look at the next figure two, the top one, what we plot there is the yield of a crop. So that's the experiment that Tony Fisher did in the 80s. So he had a wheat crop. He used shading to cause uh, stress. So he placed the shading here for 10 days and then he moved it somewhere else. So over the season he had 10 times of shading and then you plot yield depending on the time of, of uh, shading. So if you shade, shade the crop or if it's water deficit or some stress early, it doesn't matter, the crops recover. If the stress is very late in the season, it doesn't matter either. So this a critical window which is narrow is late stem elongation 10 days after flowering. That's the critical window of wheat, barley and oats. All these areas are about the same. So it's only a few weeks in the season where uh, what happens in the crops will give you the, the, the yield at the end. Of course, you would have grain filling and so forth, but that's the core uh, um, part of the season. And if you see in that figure the green uh, curve for pulses and canola, the critical period for pulses and canola is shift. It's not around flowering, it's more about podding. So the consequences for this is if we think of the crop in three stages, establishment, critical period, and grain filling, and that's a, an analogy I, I often use. How do you invest 100 bucks in the three? Not so much in, in what you do, but in thinking. So I would invest 50 in the critical period and the other 50 in establishment and and the uh, grain filling. That's just an idea of how important this critical period is. 
if we look at uh, figure two in the middle A, so we have again yield and grain number. 80% of the variation in yield, that's a crop in Rosworthy between two and seven tons. 80% of the variation is grain number. And then B is grain number as a function of growth rate in the critical period. So we can think of yield proportional to grain number and three traits in the critical period. The duration, a long critical period would give you more yield, and that's why you have high yields in this kind of environments with mild temperature. The second is the growth rate during the critical period, and the third is uh, the partitioning, how much of the growth goes to the head and grains, because the plant is, so those crops at the back, those barley and wheat, they are close to flowering or thereabouts, so the, they grow growing fast, and part of the growth goes to the head, but part goes to the root, and part goes to reserves. So that there's a bit of, of variation there. But with this focus on the critical period, um, you could see in station two, they are later with Nick, and in station here, uh, five here in, with John, have a look at Rockstar with low input or, or not, not fungicide. The, the canopy doesn't look good. That crop would have a low yield. And agronomically, that's trivial. You see the crop and say, yeah, it won't yield OK. But the reason it won't read, uh, yield OK is the canopy is compromised in the critical period. So the growth rate of that crop is compromised because the size of the canopy is small. You see there's no full ground cover, and they look, the leaves don't look Wood. So the size and the function of the canopy is compromised. The growth rate of the crop in that window has been compromised, and that's the explanation why those crops will be low yielding. Again, the, the point is we have establishment, critical period, and, and uh, grain filling. Focus on the on the critical period. Um, and the, the last figure there, figure three, is, is a comparison between two uh, systems. In blue is a high-yielding crop. If you think world records, you would think uh, uh, England, that kind of environments with very long seasons. And there is the um, association. You need a long season to have a high yield. But, but what you see here and what you see in red there is, uh, is against that idea. You don't need a long season. What you need it's a critical period that's long, and the, the crop is healthy, it's growing fast, and it's putting resources to grain. So the red one there is southern Chile, which is not too different to this. So the crops are sown in September, harvested in late Jan or February. That's what you have with the, with the uh, late sown barleys here and weeds, and you see you get your, what, 10 tons or something? with, with five, six months. So it's not the season length that matters. So that reinforces this. The white arrows in the figure three show a representation of the critical period. That's what matters. is how long it is, how healthy the crop is, whether there is water, nutrients, all, all the rest. And all these trials, you will see, will show you the management of fertilizer, the management of fungicide, the varieties that have different resistance to, to, to the current pathotypes, all that converges in having a, a healthy canopy, full cover, and, and full functioning during the critical period. And then you would also see in station three with Ben this idea of the relation between radiation and temperature. So with more radiation, there's more photosynthesis, but with high temperature, development is faster. So it shortens the critical period. That's why you have essentially the low yield of uh, crops at, in warm conditions in, high lati in, in low latitudes or inland or late zone crops. The reason they are uh, low yielding is because development is fast. It's shortening that window when the crop is is making grain. So if you open a head of, of wheat or barley in, in, in the critical period, what you would see is this. The florets 
are developed. Again, the plant overshoots and then they are killed. And it's that stage of mortality of florets that gets you to the final grain number. And that's where the focus should be for, for high yielding crops. So, back to the take home messages. To wrap up, yield is a function of grain number. And grain number is defined in a critical window that only depends on the species. It doesn't depend on variety or soil or climate or management. We know the critical period for, for cereals is 30 days before flowering, 10 days after flowering. For pulses, it's a bit later. And yield depends on three traits. The duration of that window, how fast the crop grows, and the partitioning. And this applies no matter what. So in contrast to the question, how much fertilizer do we need? This is rock solid. It's as strong as you get. Hope some of this resonates and and uh, forward to comments and questions.